Andre Romanovich Chikatilo, Russian. Cyrillic capital letter E, Cyrillic small letter E N, Cyrillic small letter T, Cyrillic small letter E R, Cyrillic small letter I, combining acute accent, Cyrillic small letter short one, Cyrillic capital letter E R, Cyrillic small letter O, Cyrillic small letter E M, Cyrillic small letter E, combining acute accent, Cyrillic small letter E N, Cyrillic small letter O, Cyrillic small letter V, Cyrillic small letter I. Cyrillic small letter J, Cyrillic capital letter J, Cyrillic small letter I, Cyrillic small letter K, Cyrillic small letter E, Cyrillic small letter T, Cyrillic small letter I, combining acute accent, Cyrillic small letter L, Cyrillic small letter O, Romanized, Andre Romanovic Sikatilo, Ukrainian, Cyrillic capital letter E, Cyrillic small letter N, Cyrillic small letter T. Cyrillic small letter ER, Cyrillic small letter BL or Russian Ukrainian 1, Cyrillic small letter short 1, Cyrillic capital letter ER, Cyrillic small letter O, Cyrillic small letter EM, Cyrillic small letter E, Cyrillic small letter EN, Cyrillic small letter O, Cyrillic small letter V, Cyrillic small letter I, Cyrillic small letter J, Cyrillic capital letter J, Cyrillic small letter I, Cyrillic small letter K. Cyrillic small letter E, Cyrillic small letter T, Cyrillic small letter I, Cyrillic small letter L, Cyrillic small letter O, Romanized. Andrit Romanovic Sikatilo, the 16th of October 1936, the 14th of February 1994, was a Soviet serial killer, nicknamed the Butcher of Rostov, the Red Ripper, and the Rostov Ripper, who sexually assaulted, murdered, and mutilated at least 52 women and children between 1978 and 1990 in the Russian SFSR, the Ukrainian SSR, and the Uzbek SSR. Chai Katilo confessed to 56 murders and was tried for 53 of these killings in April 1992. He was convicted and sentenced to death for 52 of these murders in October 1992, although the Supreme Court of Russia ruled in 1993 that insufficient evidence existed to prove Chaikatilo's guilt in nine of these murders. Chaikatilo was subsequently executed in February 1994. Chaikatilo was known as the Rostov Ripper and the Butcher of Rostov because he committed most of his murders in the Rostov Oblast of the Russian SFSR. Early Life Childhood Andrei Chikatilo was born on the 16th of October 1936 in the village of Yablukny in the Sumy Oblast of the Ukrainian SSR. At the time of his birth, Ukraine was in the grip of a famine caused by Joseph Stalin's forced collectivization of agriculture. Chikatilo's parents were both collective farm laborers who lived in a one-room hut. They received no wages for their work, but instead received the right to cultivate a plot of land behind the family hut. The family seldom had sufficient food. Chaikatilo himself later claimed not to have eaten bread until the age of 12, adding that he and his family often had to eat grass and leaves in an effort to stave off hunger. Throughout his childhood, Chikatilo was repeatedly told by his mother Anna that prior to his birth, an older brother of his named Stepan had, at age 4, been kidnapped and cannibalized by starving neighbors, although it has never been established whether this incident actually occurred, or if a step in Chikotilo even existed. Nonetheless, Chikotilo recalled his childhood as being blotted by poverty, ridicule, hunger, and war. When the Soviet Union entered the Second World War, Chikatilo's father Roman was conscripted into the Red Army. He would later be taken prisoner after being wounded in combat. Between 1941 and 1944, Chikotilo witnessed some of the effects of the Nazi occupation of Ukraine, which he described as horrors, adding he witnessed bombings, fires, and shootings from which he and his mother would hide in cellars and ditches. On one occasion, Chikotilo and his mother were forced to watch their own hut burn to the ground. With his father at war, Chikotilo and his mother shared a single bed. He was a chronic bedwetter, and his mother berated and beat him for each offense. In 1943, Chikatilo's mother gave birth to a baby girl, Tatyana. Because Chikatilo's father had been conscripted in 1941, he could not have fathered this child. 
As many Ukrainian women were raped by German soldiers during the war, it has been speculated Tatyana was conceived as a result of a rape committed by a German soldier. As Chikatilo and his mother lived in a one-room hut, this rape may have been committed in Chikatilo's presence. In September 1944, Chikatilo began his schooling. Although shy and ardently studious as a child, he was physically weak and regularly attended school in homespun clothing and, by 1946, with his stomach swollen from hunger resulting from the post-war famine which plagued much of the Soviet Union. On several occasions, this hunger caused Chikatilo to faint both at home and at school, and he was consistently targeted by bullies who regularly mocked him over his physical stature and timid nature. At home, Chikatilo and his sister were constantly berated by their mother. Tatyana later recalled that in spite of the hardships endured by her parents, their father was a kind man, whereas their mother was harsh and unforgiving toward her children. Chikatilo developed a passion for reading and memorizing data, and often studied at home, both to increase his sense of self worth and to compensate for his myopia, which often prevented him from reading the classroom blackboard. To his teachers, Chikatilo was an excellent student upon whom they would regularly bestow praise and commendation. Adolescence by his teens, Chikatilo was both a model student and an ardent communist. He was appointed editor of his school newspaper at age 14 and chairman of the Pupils' Communist Party Committee two years later. An avid reader of communist literature, he was also delegated the task of organizing street marches. Although Chikatilo claimed learning did not come easy to him due to headaches and a poor memory, he was the only student from his collective farm to complete the final year of study, graduating with excellent grades in 1954.80. The onset of puberty, Chikatilo discovered that he suffered from chronic impotence, worsening his social awkwardness and self-hatred. He was shy in the company of women. His first crush, at age 17, he had been on a girl named Lilia Barisheva, with whom he had become acquainted through his school newspaper, yet he was chronically nervous in her company and never asked her for a date. The same year, Chikatilo jumped upon an 11-year-old friend of his younger sister and wrestled her to the ground, ejaculating as the girl struggled in his grasp. Following his graduation, Chikatilo applied for a scholarship at Moscow State University. Although he passed the entrance examination with good to excellent scores, his grades were not deemed good enough for acceptance. Chikatilo speculated his scholarship application was rejected due to his father's tainted war record. His father had been branded a traitor for being taken prisoner in 1943, but the truth was that other students had performed better in a highly competitive exam. He did not attempt to enroll at another university. Instead, he traveled to the city of Kursk, where he worked as a laborer for three months before, in 1955, enrolling in a vocational school with the aim of becoming a communications technician. The same year, Chikatilo formed his first serious relationship with a local girl two years his junior. On three separate occasions, the couple attempted intercourse. Although on each occasion, Chikatilo was unable to sustain an erection. After 18 months, she broke off the relationship. Army service upon completion of his two-year vocational training, Chikatilo relocated to the Ural city of Nizhny Tagil to work upon a long-term construction project. While living in Nizhny Tagil, he also undertook correspondence courses in engineering with the Moscow Electrotechnical Institute of Communication. He worked in the Urals for two years until he was drafted into the Soviet Army in 1957. Chikatilo performed his compulsory military service between 1957 and 1960, assigned first to serve with border guards in Central Asia, then to a KGB communications unit in Berlin. Here, his work record was unblemished, and he joined the Communist Party in 1960, shortly before his military service ended. Upon completing his service, Chikatilo returned to his native village to live with his parents. He soon became acquainted with a young divorcee.
Their three-month relationship ended after several unsuccessful attempts at intercourse, after which the woman innocently asked her friends for advice as to how Chikotilo might overcome his inability to maintain an erection. As a result, most of his peers discovered his impotence. In a 1993 interview regarding this incident, Chikotilo stated, Girls were going behind my back, whispering that I was impotent. I was so ashamed. I tried to hang myself. My mother and some young neighbors pulled me out of the noose. Well, I thought no one would want such a shame man. So I had to run away from there, away from my homeland. Moved to Rostov-on-Don after several months, Chikatilo found a job as a communications engineer in a town located north of Rostov-on-Don. He relocated to the Russian SFSR in 1961, renting a small apartment close to his workplace. The same year, his younger sister, Tatyana, finished her schooling and moved into his apartment. His parents would relocate to the Rostov region shortly thereafter. Tatyana lived with her brother for six months before marrying a local youth and moving into her in-law's home. She noted nothing untoward with regard to her brother's lifestyle beyond his chronic shyness around women, and resolved to help her brother find a wife and start a family. Marriage in 1963 Chikatilo married a woman named Fyodoja Adnesheva, to whom he had been introduced by his younger sister. According to Chikatilo, although he was attracted to Fyodoja, his marriage was effectively an arranged one which occurred barely two weeks after they had met and in which the decisive roles were played by his sister and her husband. Chikatilo later claimed that his marital sex life was minimal and that, after his wife understood he was unable to maintain an erection, they agreed she would conceive by him ejaculating externally and pushing his semen inside her vagina with his fingers. In 1965, Fyodoroja gave birth to a daughter, Lyudmila. Four years later, in 1969, a son named Yuri was born. Teaching career Chikatilo chose to enroll as a correspondence student at Rostov University in 1964, studying Russian literature and philology. He obtained his degree in these subjects in 1970. Shortly before obtaining his degree, Chikatilo obtained the job managing regional sports activities. He remained in this position for one year, before beginning his career as a teacher of Russian language and literature in Novoshakhtinsk. Chikatilo was largely ineffective as a teacher, although knowledgeable in the subjects he taught, he was seldom able to maintain discipline in his classes and was regularly subjected to mockery by his students who, he claimed, took advantage of his modest nature. Sexual assaults In May 1973, Chikatilo committed his first known sexual assault upon one of his pupils. In this incident, he swam towards a 15-year-old girl and groped her breasts and genitals, ejaculating as the girl struggled against his grasp. Months later, Chikatilo sexually assaulted another teenage girl whom he had locked in his classroom. He was not disciplined for either of these incidents, nor for the occasions in which fellow teachers observed Chikatilo fondling himself in the presence of his students. One of Chikatilo's duties at this school was ensuring his students who boarded at the school were present in their dormitories in the evenings. On several occasions, he is known to have entered the girls' dormitory in the hope of seeing them undressed. In response to the increasing number of complaints lodged against him by his students, the director of the school summoned Chikatilo to a formal meeting and informed him he should either resign voluntarily or be fired. Chikatilo left his employment discreetly and found another job as a teacher at another school in Novoshaktinsk in January 1974. He lost this job as a result of staff cutbacks in September 1978, before finding another teaching position in Shakhti, a coal mining town close to rostov on don Chikatilo's career as a teacher ended in March 1981 following several complaints of child molestation against pupils of both sexes. The same month, 
he began a job as a supply clerk for a factory based in Rostov which produced construction materials. This job required Chikatilo to travel extensively across much of the Soviet Union to either physically purchase the raw materials required to fulfill production quotas or to negotiate supply contracts. Initial Murders Murder of Yelena Zakotnova In September 1978, Chikatilo moved to Shakti, where he committed his first documented murder. On the 22nd of December, Chikatilo lured a nine-year-old girl named Yelena Zakotnova to an old house which he had secretly purchased. He attempted to rape her but failed to achieve an erection. When the girl struggled, he choked her and stabbed her three times in the abdomen, ejaculating while stabbing the child. In an interview after his 1990 arrest, Chikatilo later recalled that immediately after stabbing Zakotnova, the girl had said something very hoarsely, whereupon he strangled her into unconsciousness before throwing her body into the nearby Grushevka River. Her body was found two days later. Numerous pieces of evidence linked Chikatilo to Zakitnova's murder. Spots of blood had been found in the snow near the house Chikatilo had purchased. Neighbors had noted that Chikatilo had been present in the house on the evening of the 22nd of December. Zakitnova's school rucksack had been found upon the opposite bank of the river at the end of the street, indicating the girl had been thrown into the river at this location, and the witness had given police a detailed description of a man closely resembling Chikatilo, whom she had seen talking with Zakitnova at the bus stop where the girl had last been seen alive. Despite these facts, a 25-year-old laborer named Alexandra Kravchenko, who had previously served a prison sentence for the rape and murder of a teenage girl, was arrested for the crime. A search of Kravchenko's home revealed spots of blood on his wife's jumper. The blood type was determined to match both Zakatnova and Kravchenko's wife. Kravchenko had a watertight alibi for the afternoon of the 22nd of December 1978. He had been at home with his wife and a friend of hers the entire afternoon, and neighbors of the couple were able to verify this. Nonetheless, the police, having threatened Kravchenko's wife with being an accomplice to murder and her friend with perjury, obtained new statements in which the women claimed Kravchenko had not returned home until late in the evening on the day of the murder. Confronted with these altered testimonies, Kravchenko confessed to the killing. He was tried for the murder in 1979. At his trial, Kravchenko retracted his confession and maintained his innocence, stating his confession had been obtained under extreme duress. Despite his retraction, Kravchenko was convicted of the murder and sentenced to death. This sentence was commuted to 15 years imprisonment, the maximum possible length of imprisonment at the time by the Supreme Court in December 1980. Under pressure from the victim's relatives, Kravchenko was retried, erroneously convicted, and eventually executed by firing squad for Zakitnova's murder in July 1983. Following Zakitnova's murder, Chikatilo was able to achieve sexual arousal and orgasm only through stabbing and slashing women and children to death, and he later claimed that the urge to relive the experience had overwhelmed him. Nonetheless, Chikatilo did stress that, initially, he had struggled to resist these urges, often cutting short business trips to return home rather than face the temptation to search for a victim. Second murder and subsequent killings On 3 September 1981, Chikatilo encountered a 17-year-old boarding school student, named Larissa Kachenko, standing at a bus stop as he exited a public library in Rostov city center. According to his subsequent confession, Chikatilo lured Kachenko to a forest near the Don River with the pretext of drinking vodka and relaxing. When they reached a secluded area, he threw the girl to the ground before tearing off her clothes and attempting intercourse, as Kachenko remonstrated against his actions. When Chikatilo failed to achieve an erection, he forced mud inside her mouth to stifle her screams before battering and strangling her to death. As he had no knife, Chikatilo mutilated the body with his teeth and a stick. He also tore one nipple from Kachenko's body with his teeth before loosely covering her body with leaves, branches, 
and torn pages of newspaper. Kachenko's body was found the following day. Nine months after the murder of Kachenko, on the 12th of June 1982, Chikatilo traveled by bus to the Bagayevsky district of Rostov to purchase vegetables. Having to change buses in the village of Donskoye, he decided to continue his journey on foot. Walking away from the bus station, he encountered a 13-year-old girl, Lyubov Buryuk, who was walking home from a shopping trip. Once the path both were taking together was shielded from the view of potential witnesses by bushes, Chikotilo pounced upon Buryuk, dragged her into nearby undergrowth, tore off her dress, and killed her by stabbing and slashing her to death as he imitated performing intercourse. When her body was found on the 27th of June, the medical examiner discovered evidence of 22 knife wounds inflicted to the head, neck, chest, and pelvic region. Further wounds found on the skull suggested the killer had attacked Buryuk from behind with the handle and blade of his knife. In addition, Several striations were discovered upon Buryuk's eye sockets. Following Buryuk's murder, Chikatilo no longer attempted to resist his homicidal urges. Between July and September 1982, he killed a further five victims between the ages of 9 and 18. He established a pattern of approaching children, runaways, and young vagrants at bus or railway stations, enticing them to a nearby forest or other secluded area and killing them, usually by stabbing, slashing and eviscerating the victim with a knife. Although some victims, in addition to receiving the multitude of knife wounds, were also strangled or battered to death. Many of the victims' bodies bore evidence of mutilation to the eye sockets. Pathologists concluded these injuries had been caused by a knife, leading investigators to the conclusion the killer had gouged out the eyes of his victims. Chikatilo's adult female victims were often prostitutes or homeless women whom he would lure to secluded areas with promises of alcohol or money. Chikatilo would typically attempt intercourse with these victims, but he would usually be unable to achieve or maintain an erection. This would send him into a murderous fury, particularly if the woman mocked his impotence. He would achieve orgasm only when he stabbed and slashed the victim to death. His child and adolescent victims were of both sexes. Chai Catalo would lure these victims to secluded areas using a variety of ruses, usually formed in the initial conversation with the victim, such as promising them assistance or company, or offering to show them a shortcut, a chance to view rare stamps, films or coins, or with an offer of food or candy. He would usually overpower these victims once they were alone, often tying their hands behind their backs with a length of rope before stuffing mud or loam into the victim's mouth to silence their screams, and then proceed to kill them. After the killing, Chikatilo would make rudimentary, though seldom serious, efforts to conceal the body before leaving the crime scene. On the 11th of December 1982 Chikatilo encountered a 10-year-old girl named Olga Stalmakinok riding a bus to her parents' home in Novoshaktinsk and persuaded the child to leave the bus with him. She was last seen by a fellow passenger, who reported that a middle-aged man had led the girl away firmly by the hand. Chikatilo lured the girl to a cornfield on the outskirts of Novoshaktinsk, stabbed her in excess of 50 times around the head and body ripped open her chest and excised her lower bowel and uterus. Investigation by January 1983, four victims thus far killed had been tentatively linked to the same killer. A Moscow police team, headed by Major Mikhail Fetisov, was sent to Rostov-on-Don to direct the investigation, which gradually became known among investigators as Operation Forest Path. Fetisov established a team of ten investigators based in Rostov, charged with solving all four cases. In March, Fetisov assigned a newly appointed specialist forensic analyst, Viktor Burkov, to head the investigation. The following month, August Damakinok's body was found. Burkov was summoned to the crime scene, where he examined the numerous knife wounds and eviscerations conducted upon the child, and the striations on her eye sockets. Burkov later stated that, as he noted the striations upon Stomachinox eye sockets, 
Any doubts about the presence of a serial killer evaporated. Chikatilo did not kill again until June 1983, when he murdered a 15 year old Armenian girl named Laura Sarkisyan. Her body was found close to an unmarked railway platform near Shakti. By September, he had killed a further five victims. The accumulation of bodies found and the similarities between the pattern of wounds inflicted on the victims forced the Soviet authorities to acknowledge that a serial killer was on the loose. On the 6th of September 1983, the public prosecutor of the USSR formally linked six of the murders thus far attributed to the same killer. Due to the sheer savagery of the murders and the precision of the eviscerations upon the victims' bodies, police theorized that the killings had been conducted by either a group harvesting organs to sell for transplant, the work of a satanic cult, or a mentally ill individual. Much of the police effort concentrated upon the theory that the killer must be mentally ill, homosexual, or a pedophile, and the alibis of all individuals who had either spent time in psychiatric wards or had been convicted of homosexuality or pedophilia were checked and logged in a card filing system. Registered sex offenders were also investigated and, if their alibi was corroborated, Eliminated from the inquiry. Beginning in September 1983, several young men confessed to the murders, although these individuals were often intellectually disabled youths who admitted to the crimes only under prolonged and often brutal interrogation. Three known homosexuals and a convicted sex offender committed suicide as a result of the investigators' heavy handed tactics. As a result of the investigation, more than 1,000 unrelated crimes, including 95 murders, 140 aggravated assaults, and 245 rapes, were solved. However, as police obtained confessions from suspects, bodies continued to be discovered, proving that the suspects who had confessed could not be the killer the police were seeking. On the 30th of October 1983, the eviscerated body of a 19-year-old prostitute, named Vera Shevkun, was found in Shakti. Shevkun had been killed on the 27th of October. Although the mutilations inflicted upon Shevkun's body were otherwise characteristic of those found upon other victims linked to the unknown murderer, the victim's eyes had not been enucleated or otherwise wounded. Two months later, on the 27th of December, a 14-year-old Gukovo schoolboy, named Sergei Markov, was lured off a train and murdered at a rural station near Nova Cherkask. Markov was emasculated and suffered over 70 knife wounds to his neck and upper torso before being eviscerated. 1984 In January and February 1984, Chikatilo killed two women in Rostov's Aviators Park. On the 24th of March, he lured a 10-year-old boy, named Dmitry Tashnikov, away from a stamp kiosk in Novoshaktinsk. While walking with the boy, Chikatilo was seen by several witnesses who were able to give investigators a detailed description of the killer. When Tashnikov's body was found three days later, police also found a footprint of the killer in both semen and saliva samples on the victim's clothing. On the 25th of May, Chikatilo killed a young woman named Tatyana Petrosian and her 10-year-old daughter, Svetlana, in a wooded area outside Shakti. Petrosian had known Chikatilo for several years prior to her murder. By the end of July, he had killed three additional young women between the ages of 19 and 21, and a 13-year-old boy. In the summer of 1984, Chikatilo was fired from his work as a supply clerk for the theft of a roll of linoleum. The accusation had been filed against him the previous February, and he had been asked to resign quietly but had refused to do so, as he had denied the charges. Chai Catalo found another job as a supply clerk in Rostov on the 1st of August. On the 2nd of August, Chikatilo killed a 16-year-old girl, Natalia Galasovskaya, in Aviators Park. On the 7th of August, he lured a 17-year-old girl, Lyudmila Alexaeva, to the banks of the Don River on the pretense of showing her a shortcut to a bus terminal.
Alexieva suffered 39 slash wounds to her body before Chikotilo mutilated and disemboweled her, intentionally inflicting wounds he knew would not be immediately fatal. Her body was found in the following morning, her excised upper lip inside her mouth. Hours after Alexieva's murder, Chikatilo flew to the Uzbekistan capital of Tashkent on a business trip. By the time he had returned to Rostov on the 15th of August, he had killed an unidentified young woman and a 10-year-old girl. Within two weeks, an 11-year-old boy named Alexander Chepel had been found on the banks of the Don River strangled and castrated, with his eyes gouged out, just yards from where Alexieva's body had earlier been found. Chikatilo then killed a young librarian, Irina Lukinskaya, in Aviators Park on the 6th of September. First arrest and release on the 13th of September 1984, Chikatilo was observed by two undercover detectives attempting to talk to young women at the Rostov bus station. The detectives followed him as he wandered through the city, trying to approach women and committing acts of fraudism in public places. Upon Chikatilo's arrival at the city's central market, he was arrested and held. A search of his belongings revealed a knife with a 20 centimeters, 8 microsecond inches blade, several lengths of rope, and a jar of vase line. He was also discovered to be under investigation for minor theft at one of his former employers, which gave the investigators the legal right to hold him for a prolonged period of time. Chai Catalo's dubious background was uncovered, and his physical description matched the description of the man seen walking alongside Dmitry Tashnikov prior to the boy's murder. A sample of Chai Catalo's blood was taken, the results of which revealed his blood group to be type A, whereas semen samples found upon a total of six victims murdered by the unknown killer throughout the spring and summer of 1984 had been classified by medical examiners to be type A B. Chai Catalo's name was added to the card index file used by investigators, however, the results of his blood type analysis largely discounted him as being the unknown killer. Chikatilo was found guilty of theft of property from his previous employer and sentenced to one year in prison, but was freed on the 12th of December 1984 after serving three months. On the 8th of October 1984, the head of the Russian Public Prosecutor's Office formally linked 23 of Chikatilo's murders into one case and dropped all charges against the mentally handicapped youths who had previously confessed to the murders. Later murders upon his release from prison in December 1984, Chikatilo found new work at a locomotive factory in Nova Cherkask and kept a low profile. He did not kill again until the 1st of August 1985 when, on a business trip to Moscow, he encountered an 18-year-old woman, named Natalia Poklistova, at a railway platform near Domodedovo Airport. Poklistova was lured into a thicket of woods where she was bound, stabbed 38 times, then strangled to death. Based upon the hypothesis that the killer had traveled from the Rostov Oblast to Moscow via air, investigators checked all Airflot flight records of passengers who had commuted between Moscow and the Rostov Oblast between late July and early August. On this occasion, however, Chikatilo had traveled to Moscow by train and, accordingly, no documentation existed for investigators to research. Four weeks later, on the 27th of August, Chikatilo killed another young woman, Irina Gulyayeva, in Shakti. As had been the case with Poklistova, the wounds inflicted upon the victim linked her murder to the hunt for the serial killer. In November 1985, a special procurator, Issa Kostoyev, was appointed to supervise the investigation, which had by this stage expanded to include 15 procurators and 29 detectives assigned to work exclusively upon the manhunt. The known murders linked to the manhunt were carefully reinvestigated, and police began another round of questioning of known sex offenders and homosexuals. The following month, the militia resumed the patrolling of railway stations around Rostov, and plain-clothed female officers were ordered to loiter around bus and train stations. At the request of Viktor Burkov, police also took the step of consulting a psychiatrist, 
Dr. Alexander Bukhanovsky, the first such consultation in a serial killer investigation in the Soviet Union. All crime scene and medical examiner's reports were made available to Bukhanovsky, upon the understanding he would produce a psychological profile of the unknown murderer for investigators. Bukhanovsky's 65 page psychological profile described the killer as a reclusive man aged between 45 and 50 years old who had endured a painful and isolated childhood and who was incapable of flirting or courtship with women. This individual was of average intelligence, likely to be married and to have fathered children, but also a sadist who suffered from impotence and could achieve sexual arousal only by seeing his victims suffer. The murders themselves were an analog to the sexual intercourse. This individual was incapable of performing, and his knife became a substitute for a penis which failed to function normally. Because many of the killings had occurred on weekdays near mass transport hubs and across the entire Rostov Oblast, Bukhanovsky also argued that the killer's work required him to travel regularly, and based upon the actual days of the week when the killings had occurred, the killer was most likely tied to a production schedule. Chikatilo followed the investigation carefully reading newspaper reports about the manhunt for the killer which had begun to appear in the news media, and keeping his homicidal urges under control. For almost a year following the August 1985 murder of Irina Gulyayeva, no further victims were found in either the Rostov or Moscow oblasts whose bodies bore the signature mutilations of the unknown murderer. Investigators did tentatively link the murder of a 33-year-old woman named Yubov Golovaka, found stabbed to death in the Myasnikovsky district of Rostov on the 23rd of July 1986, to the investigation, although this was solely upon the basis that the killer's semen type matched that of the killer they were seeking, that the victim had been stripped naked prior to her murder, and that she had been stabbed in excess of 20 times. The victim had not been dismembered or otherwise mutilated, nor had she been seen near mass transportation. Because of these discrepancies, many investigators expressed serious doubts as to whether Galavaka's murder had been committed by the killer they were seeking. On the 18th of August 1986, a victim was found buried in a depression of earth in the grounds of a collective farm in the city of Bataysk. The wounds inflicted on this victim bore the trademark mutilations of victims linked to the man on kill between 1982 and 1985. The victim was an 18-year-old secretary named Irina Pogorielova. Pogorielova's body bore all of the trademark mutilations of the previous victims. Her body had been slid open from the neck to the genitalia, with one breast removed and her eyes cut out. As the murderer had made serious efforts to bury the body, some investigators theorized that this explained the sudden dearth in the number of victims found. By the autumn of 1986, investigators in Rostov theorized that the unknown killer may have moved to another part of the Soviet Union and continued killing there. As the three victims killed in the Rostov Oblast in 1985 and 1986 had died in August, some investigators gave credence to the possibility the perpetrator may have relocated to another part of the Soviet Union and may only be returning to the Rostov Oblast in summer. The Rostov police compiled bulletins to be sent to all forces throughout the Soviet Union describing the pattern of wounds their unknown killer inflicted upon his victims and requesting feedback from any police force who had discovered murder victims with wounds matching those upon the victims found in the Rostov Oblast. The response was negative. In 1987 Chikatilo killed three times. On each occasion the murder took place while he was on a business trip far away from the Rostov Oblast and none of these murders were linked to the manhunt in Rostov. Chikatilo's first murder in 1987 was committed on the 16th of May, when he encountered a 12-year-old boy, named Oleg Makarankov, at a train station in the Ural's town of Revda. Makarankov was lured from the station with the promise of sharing a meal with Chikatilo at his dacha. He was murdered in woodland close to the station, although his body would remain undiscovered until 1991. In July, he killed a 12-year-old boy, named Ivan Bilovitsky, in the Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia, and on the 15th of September, he killed a 16-year-old vocational school student, 
named Yuri Tereshonok, in woodland on the outskirts of Leningrad. Definitive resurfacing in 1988 Chikatilo killed three times, murdering an unidentified woman in Krasny Sulen in April and two boys in May and July. His first murder victim was lured off a train at Krasny Sulin before Chikatilo bound her hands behind her back and stuffed her mouth with dirt, before severing her nose from her face and inflicting numerous knife wounds to her neck. Chikatilo then bludgeoned her to death with a slab of concrete. Her body was found on the 6th of April. Investigators noted that the knife wounds inflicted upon this victim were similar to those inflicted on the victims linked to the manhunt and killed between 1982 and 1985, but as the woman had been killed with a slab of concrete and had not been disemboweled, investigators were unsure whether to link this murder to the investigation. In May, Chikatilo killed a nine-year-old boy, named Alexei Voronko, in Ilovysk, Ukraine. The boy's wounds left no doubt the killer had struck again, and this murder was linked to the manhunt. On the 14th of July, Chikatilo killed 15-year-old Yevgeny Muratov at Donleskov station near Shakti. Muratov's murder was also linked to the investigation, although his body was not found until April 1989. Although his remains were largely skeletal, Muratov's autopsy revealed he had been emasculated and suffered at least 30 knife wounds. Chikatilo did not kill again until the 1st of March 1989, when he killed a 16-year-old girl in his daughter's vacant apartment. He dismembered her body and hid the remains in a sewer. As the victim had been dismembered, police did not link her murder to the investigation. Between May and August, Chikatilo killed a further four victims, three of whom were killed in Rostov and Shakti, although only two of these victims were linked to the killer. With the resurfacing of victims definitively linked to the manhunt and the fact the majority of these victims' bodies had been discovered close to railway stations, investigators assigned numerous plain-clothed officers to discreetly film and photograph passengers on trains throughout the Rostov Oblast. Several trains were also fitted with hidden cameras with the intention of filming or photographing a victim in the company of his or her murderer. On the 14th of January 1990, Chikatilo encountered 11 year old Andrei Kravchenko standing outside a Shakti theater. Kravchenko was lured from the theater on the pretext of being shown imported Western films Chikatilo claimed to have at his residence. His extensively stabbed, emasculated body was found in a secluded section of woodland the following month. Seven weeks after Kravchenko's murder, on the 7th of March, Chikotilo lured a 10-year-old boy, named Yaroslav Makarov, from a Rostov train station to Rostov's botanical gardens. His eviscerated body was found the following day. On the 11th of March, the leaders of the investigation, headed by Mikhail Fetisov, held a meeting to discuss progress made in the manhunt. Fetisov was under intense pressure from the public, the press, and the Ministry of the Interior in Moscow to solve the case. The intensity of the manhunt in the years up to 1984 had receded to a degree between 1985 and 1987, when Chikatilo had committed only three murders investigators had conclusively linked to the killer, all killed by 1986. However, by March 1990, a further six victims had been linked to the killer. In addition, following the introduction of greater media freedom as a result of Glasnost, the Soviet news media was much less repressed than it had been in the early years of the manhunt and as such, devoted extensive publicity to the case. Fetisov had also noted laxity in some areas of the investigation and warned that people would be fired if the killer was not caught soon. Chikatilo had killed three further victims by August 1990. On the 4th of April, he lured a 31-year-old woman named Lyubov Zyaeva, off a train and killed her in woodland near Donleskov station. Her body was not found until the 24th of August. On the 28th of July, he lured a 13-year-old boy, named Viktor Petrov, away from a Rostov railway station and killed him in Rostov's botanical gardens, and on the 14th of August, he killed an 11-year-old boy, named Ivan Fomin, in the reeds near Novocherkask Beach. 
snare the discovery of more victims sparked a massive police operation. Because several victims' bodies had been discovered at railway stations on one rail route through the Rostov Oblast, Viktor Burkov suggested a plan to saturate all larger stations in the Rostov Oblast with an obvious uniform police presence which the killer could not fail to notice. The intention was to discourage the killer from attempting to strike at any of these locations, and to have undercover agents patrol smaller and less busy stations, where the murderer's activities would be more likely to be noticed. The plan was approved, and both the uniformed and undercover officers were instructed to question any adult man in the company of a young woman or child, and note his name and passport number. Police deployed 360 men at all the stations in the Rostov Oblast, but only undercover officers were posted at the three smallest stations on the route through the Oblast where the killer had struck most frequently, Kurpachnaya, Donetskaya, and Lezo Steppe, in an effort to force the killer to strike at one of those three stations. The operation was implemented on the 27th of October, 1990.0n the 30th of October. Police found the body of a 16-year-old boy, named Vadim Gromov, at Donleskov station. The wounds upon Gromov's body immediately linked his murder to the manhunt. The youth had been strangled, stabbed 27 times and castrated, with the tip of his tongue severed and his left eye stabbed. Gromov had been killed on the 17th of October, 10 days before the start of the initiative. The same day Gromov's body was found, Chikatil alert another 16-year-old boy, Viktor Tishchenko, off a train at Kurpichnaya Station, another station under surveillance from undercover police, and killed him in a nearby forest. Tishchenko's body, bearing 40 separate knife wounds, was found on the 3rd of November. Final murder in surveillance on the 6th of November 1990, Chikatilo killed and mutilated a 22-year-old woman, named Svetlana Korostik, in Woodland near Donleskov Station. Returning to the railway platform, he was observed by an undercover officer named Igor Rybakov, who observed Chikatilo approach a well and wash his hands and face. When he approached the station, Rybakov also noted that Chikatilo's coat had grass and soil stains on the elbows. Chikatilo also had a small red smear on his cheek and what appeared to be a severe wound on one of his fingers. To Rybakov, he looked suspicious. The only reason people entered woodland near Donleskov station at that time of year was to gather wild mushrooms, a popular pastime in Russia, but Chikatilo was not dressed like a typical forest scavenger, he was wearing more formal attire. Moreover, he had a nylon sports bag, which was unsuitable for carrying mushrooms. Rybakov stopped Chikatilo and checked his papers, but had no formal reason to arrest him. When Rybakov returned to his office, he filed a routine report, containing the name of the person he had stopped at the station, and the possible blood smear observed upon his cheek. On the 13th of November, Korostik's body was found. She was the 36th known victim linked to the manhunt. Police summoned the officer in charge of surveillance at Donleskov station, and examined the reports of all men stopped and questioned in the previous week. Not only was Chikatilo's name among those reports, but it was familiar to several officers involved in the case, because he had been questioned in 1984 and had been placed upon a 1987 suspect list compiled and distributed throughout the Soviet Union. After checking with Chikatilo's present and previous employers, investigators were able to place him in various towns and cities at times when several victims linked to the investigation had been murdered. Questioning of former colleagues from Chikatilo's teaching days revealed that he had been forced to resign from two teaching positions due to repeated complaints of lewd behavior and sexual assault made by his pupils. Police placed Chikatilo under surveillance on the 14th of November. In several instances, particularly on trains or buses, he was observed approaching lone young women or children and engaging them in conversation. If the woman or child broke off the conversation, Chikatilo would wait a few minutes and then seek another conversation partner. On the 20th of November, 
After six days of surveillance, Chikatilo left his house with a large jar, which he had filled with beer at a small kiosk in a local park before he wandered around Nova Cherkask, attempting to make contact with children he met on his way. Upon exiting a cafe, Chikatilo was arrested by four plainclothes police officers. Second arrest upon his arrest, Chikatilo gave a statement claiming that the police were mistaken, and complained that he had also been arrested in 1984 for the same series of murders. A strip search of the suspect revealed a further piece of evidence. One of Chikatilo's fingers had a flesh wound. Medical examiners concluded the wound was from a human bite. Chikatilo's penultimate victim, Viktor Tishchenko, was a physically strong youth. At the crime scene, the police had found numerous signs of a ferocious physical struggle between the victim and his murderer. Although a finger bone was later found to be broken, and his fingernail had been bitten off, Chikatilo had never sought medical treatment for his injuries. A search of Chikatilo's belongings revealed he had been in possession of a folding knife and two lengths of rope. A sample of Chikatilo's blood was taken and he was placed in a cell inside the KGB headquarters in Rostov with a police informer, who was instructed to engage Chikatilo in conversation and elicit any information he could from him. The next day, the 21st of November, formal questioning of Chikatilo began. The interrogation was performed by Issa Koskoyev. The strategy chosen by the police to elicit a confession was to lead Chikatilo to believe that he was a very sick individual in need of medical help. The intention was to give Chikatilo hope that if he confessed, he would not be prosecuted by reason of insanity. Police knew their case against Chikatilo was largely circumstantial, and under a Soviet law, they had ten days in which they could legally hold a suspect before either charging or releasing him. Blood Group Analysis On the 21st of November, the results of Chikatilo's blood test again revealed his blood type to be type A and not type AB. Due to the amount of physical and circumstantial evidence investigators had thus far compiled, which indicated Chikatilo was indeed the murderer they had been pursuing, plus the fact that investigators had deduced the blood type of the murderer they had pursued using semen samples obtained from the clothing and bodies of 14 of the victims as opposed to actual blood samples. Investigators obtained a sample of Chikatilo's semen to test his blood type, the results of which confirmed that Chikatilo's semen was type AB, whereas his blood and saliva were type A. Throughout the questioning, Chikatilo repeatedly denied that he had committed the murders, although he did confess to molesting his pupils during his career as a teacher. He also produced several written essays for Kostoyev which, although evasive regarding the actual murders, did reveal psychological symptoms consistent with those predicted by Dr. Bukhanovsky in the 1985 psychological profile he had written for the investigators. The interrogation tactics used by Kostoyev may also have caused Chikatilo to become defensive. The informer sharing a KGB cell with the suspect reported to police that Chikatilo had informed him that Kostoyev had repeatedly asked him direct questions regarding the mutilations inflicted upon the victims. Confession on the 29th of November, at the request of Burkov and Fetisov, Dr. Alexandra Bukhanovsky was invited to assist in the questioning of the suspect. Bukhanovsky read extracts from his 65-page psychological profile to Chikatilo. Within two hours, Chikatilo burst into tears and confessed to Bukhanovsky that he was indeed guilty of the crimes for which he had been arrested. After conversing into the evening, Bukhanovsky reported to Burkov and Fetisov that Chikotilo was ready to confess. Armed with the handwritten notes Bukhanovsky had prepared, Issa Kostoyev prepared a formal accusation of murder dated the 29th of November, the eve of the expiration of the 10 day time period during which Chikotilo could legally be held before being charged. The following morning, Kostoyev resumed the interrogation. According to the official protocol, Chikotilo confessed to 34 of the 36 murders police had linked to him, although he denied two additional murders committed in 1986 the police had initially believed he had committed, one of whom was Lyubov Golovaka, 
found stabbed to death on the 23rd of July 1986 and whom investigators had had serious doubts about linking to the manhunt. The second was 18-year-old Irina Pogorielova, found murdered in Batayusk on the 18th of August 1986 and whose mutilations closely matched those inflicted upon other victims linked to the manhunt. Chikatilo gave a full detailed description of each murder on the list of charges, all of which were consistent with known facts regarding each killing. When prompted, he could draw a rough sketch of various crime scenes, indicating the position of the victim's body and various landmarks in the vicinity of the crime scene. Additional details provided further proof of his guilt. One victim on the list of charges was a 19-year-old student named Anna Lamisheva, whom Chikatilo had killed on the 19th of July 1984 near Shakti Station. Chikatilo recalled that as he had fought to overpower her, she had stated that a man named Bars Leopard would retaliate for his attacking her. Lamsheva's fiancé had the nickname Bars tattooed on his hand. In describing his victims, Chikatilo falsely referred to them as D-class elements whom he would lure to secluded areas before killing. In many instances, particularly, though not exclusively, with his male victims, Chikatilo stated he would bind the victims' hands behind their back with a length of rope before he would proceed to kill them. He would typically inflict a multitude of knife wounds upon the victim, initially inflicting shallow knife wounds to the chest area before inflicting deeper stab and slash wounds, usually 30 to 50 in total, before proceeding to eviscerate the victim as he writhed atop his or her body until he achieved orgasm. He had, he stated, become adept at avoiding the spurts of blood from his victims' bodies as he inflicted the knife wounds and eviscerations upon them and would regularly sit or squant beside his victims until their hearts had stopped beating, adding that the victims' cries, the blood and the agony gave me relaxation and a certain pleasure. When questioned as to why most of his later victims' eyes had been stabbed and door slashed, but not enucleated as his earlier victims' eyes had been, Chikatilo stated that he had initially believed in an old Russian superstition that the image of a murderer is left imprinted upon the eyes of the victim. However, he stated, in later years, he had become convinced this was simply an old wife's tale and he had ceased to gouge out the eyes of his victims. Chikatilo also informed Kostoyev he had often tasted the blood of his victims, to which he stated he felt chills and shook all over. He also confessed to tearing at victims' genitalia, lips, nipples, and tongues with his teeth. In several instances, Chikatilo would cut or bite off the tongue of his victim as he performed his eviscerations, then, either at or shortly after the point of death, run around the body as he held the tongue aloft in one hand. Although he also admitted that he had chewed upon the excised uterus of his female victims and the testicles of his male victims, he stated he had later discarded these body parts. Nonetheless, Chikatilo did confess to having swallowed the nipples and tongues of some of his victims. Oh, and the 30th of November, Chikatilo was formally charged with each of the 34 murders he had confessed to, all of which had been committed between June 1982 and November. 1990. Over the following days, Chikatilo confessed to a further 22 killings which had not been connected to the case either because the murders had been committed outside the Rostov Oblast, because the bodies had not been found, or, in the case of Yelena Zakatnova, because an innocent man had been convicted and executed for the murder. As had been the case with the victims compiled upon the initial list of charges, Chikatilo was able to provide details of these additional killings only the perpetrator could have known. One of these additional victims. 14-year-old Lyubov Volobayeva had lived in southwestern Siberia and had been killed in a sorghum field near Krasnodar Airport on the 25th of July 1982. Chikatilo recalled that he had killed Volobayeva in a millet field and that he had approached the girl as she sat in the waiting rooms at Krasnodar Airport. Volobayeva, Chikatilo stated, had informed him she lived in the Siberian city of Novokuznetsk. 
and was awaiting a connecting flight at the airport to visit relatives. I in December 1990, Chikotilo led police to the body of Alexei Kobitov, a boy he had confessed to killing in August 1989 and whom he had buried in woodland near Ashakati Cemetery, proving unequivocally that he was the killer. He later led investigators to the bodies of two other victims he had confessed to killing. Three of the 56 victims Chikatilo confessed to killing could not be found or identified, but Chikatilo was charged with killing 53 women and children between 1978 and 1990. He was held in the same cell in Rostov-on-Don where he had been detained on the 20th of November to await trial. Psychiatric evaluation on the 20th of August 1991, after police had completed their interrogation, including reenactments of all the murders at each crime scene, Chikatilo was transferred to the Serbsky Institute in Moscow to undergo a 60-day psychiatric evaluation to determine whether he was mentally competent to stand trial. Chikatilo was analyzed by a senior psychiatrist, Dr. Andrei Kachenko. Kachenko did note Chikotilo suffered from various physiological problems which he attributed to prenatal brain damage, but concluded on the 18th of October that, although suffering from borderline personality disorder with sadistic features, he was fit to stand trial. In December 1991, Details of Chikatilo's arrest and a brief summary of his crimes were released to the newly corporate Russian media by police. Trial Andrei Chikatilo was brought to trial in Rostov on the 14th of April 1992, charged with 53 counts of murder in addition to five charges of sexual assault against minors committed when he had been a teacher. He was tried in courtroom number 5 of the Rostov Provincial Court, before Judge Leonid Akubzhanov. Chikatilo's trial was the first major media event of liberalized post-Soviet Russia. Shortly after his psychiatric evaluation at the Serbsky Institute, investigators had conducted a press conference in which a full list of Chikatilo's crimes was released to the press, alongside a 1984 identikit of the individual charged, but not the full name or a photograph of the accused. The media first saw Chikatilo on the first day of his trial, as he entered an iron cage specifically constructed in a corner of the courtroom to protect him from attack by the enraged and often hysterical relatives of his victims. In the opening weeks of Chikatilo's trial, the Russian press regularly published exaggerated and often sensationalistic headlines about the murders referring to Chikatilo being a cannibal or a maniac and to his physically resembling a shaven skull, demonic individual. The first two days of the trial were devoted to Judge Akubjanov reading the long lists of indictments against Chikatilo. Each murder was discussed individually, and on several occasions, relatives present in the courtroom broke down in tears or fainted when details of their relatives' murder were revealed. After reading the indictment, Judge Akubjanov announced to the journalists present in the courtroom his intention to conduct an open trial, stating, Let this trial at least teach us something, so that this will never happen anytime or anywhere again. Judge Akubjanov then asked Chikatilo to stand, identify himself and provide his date and location of birth. Chikatilo complied. Although this would prove to be one of the few civil exchanges between the judge and Chikatilo. Chikatilo was initially questioned in detail about each charge upon the indictment. Responding to specific questions regarding the murders, he often gave dismissive replies to questions, particularly when questioned as to the specific nature of the wounds he had inflicted upon his victims and the ruses he had used to entice his victims to the locations where he had killed them. He would become indignant only when accused of stealing personal possessions from the victims, or to his retaining organs excised from the victims missing from the crime scenes. On one occasion, when asked as to his seeming indifference as to the lifestyle and gender of those whom he had killed, Chikatilo replied, I did not need to look for them. Every step I took, they were there. In what became a regular, though not continuous, occurrence throughout the trial, Judge Akubjanov berated Chikatilo as he questioned him in detail as to the charges, ordering him to shut your mouth, before adding, you're not crazy.
as Chai Catalo's responses to questions deviated into his discussing issues such as the repression his family had endured throughout his childhood, and his claiming that the charges filed against him were false. These verbal exchanges would occur whether Chikatilo was cooperative or uncooperative throughout proceedings, and the manner in which the judge questioned Chikatilo repeatedly led Chai Catalo's defense lawyer. Marat Kabulyun, to protest against the accusatory nature of the court proceedings. In the instances in which Chikatilo was uncooperative throughout questioning, he would simply shout over the judge, denounce the court as a farce, and launch into rambling, disjointed speeches. On occasion, Chikatilo would also expose himself to the court or sing socialist movement anthems throughout proceedings. These antics regularly resulted in his being returned to his cell as court proceedings continued in his absence. On the 21st of April, Chai Catalo's defense lawyer requested that Dr. Bukhanovsky be allowed to testify as to the contents of the 1985 psychological profile he had written and his subsequent consultations with Chikatilo following his arrest, adding that Bukhanovsky could exert influence over Chikatilo and, by extension, my influence the court proceedings. This request was denied. The same day, Chikatilo began to refuse to answer any questions from the judge, the prosecutor or his own defense lawyer. He refused to answer any questions for three consecutive days before stating his presumption of innocence had been irredeemably violated by the judge and that he intended to give no further testimony. The following day, proceedings were adjourned for two weeks. Chai Catala withdrew his confessions to six of the killings for which he had been charged on the 13th of May and also claimed he had killed four further victims who were not included upon the indictment. The same day, his defense lawyer again submitted a request that his client be subjected to a second psychiatric evaluation. This motion was dismissed by the judge as being groundless. In response, Cabibulin rose from his seat, condemning the composition of the court, and arguing that the judge was unfit to continue presiding over the case. Chai Catalo himself repeated his earlier remarks as to the judge making numerous rash remarks prejudging his guilt. The prosecutor, Nikolai Gerasimenko, vocally supported the defense's claim, stating that the judge had indeed made too many such comments and had committed numerous procedural violations in his lecturing and insulting the defendant. Gerasimenko further contended that in his conducting an open trial, Chikatilo had already been effectively prejudged as being guilty by the press, before also requesting that the judge be replaced. On the 3rd of July, Bukhanovsky was permitted to testify as to his analysis of Chikatilo, although solely in the capacity as a witness. For three hours, Bukhanovsky testified as to his 1985 psychological profile of Chikatilo, and of the conversations he had held with Chikatilo following his arrest, which had culminated in Chai Catalo's confession. Four psychiatric experts from the Serbsky Institute also testified as to the results of a behavioral analysis they had conducted on Chikatilo in May, following the initial adjournment of the trial. All testified as to his behavior in the courtroom being strikingly at contrast to his behavior in his cell, and that they considered his antics to be a calculated attempt to obtain acquittal on the grounds of insanity. Closing Arguments and Conviction On the 9th of August, the defense delivered their closing arguments before the judge. Upon beginning his 90-minute closing argument, Marat Kabibulin first stated he had no confidence his voice would be heard above the general outcry for retribution against Chikatilo before questioning the reliability of the forensic evidence presented at the trial and describing areas of Chai Catalo's confessions as being baseless. Kabibulin also questioned the judge's objectivity and harked back to the decision of the court not to allow the defense to present testimony from independent psychiatrists, emphasizing that crimes of this nature could not have been committed by an individual of sane mind. Kabibulin then formally requested the judge find his client not guilty. The following day, prosecutor Anatoly Zadarajny delivered his closing argument before the judge. Harking towards the earlier testimony of psychiatrists at the trial, Zadarajny argued that Chikatilo fully understood the criminality of his actions, 
was able to resist his homicidal impulses, and had made numerous conscious efforts to avoid detection. Moreover, Zadarajni emphasized that in 19 of the charges, the material evidence of the crimes had been provided by Chikatilo himself. Zadarajni then recited each of the charges before formally requesting the death penalty. Following the conclusion of the prosecutor's closing argument, Judge Akubjanov invited Chikatilo back into the courtroom, before formally asking him whether he would like to make a final statement on his own behalf. In response, Chikatilo simply sat mute. Judge Akubjanov then announced an initial date of the 15th of September for himself and the two official jurors to review the evidence and pass final sentence upon Chikatilo. This date was later postponed until the 14th of October. As court announced recess, the brother of Leonard Miller Lixayeva, a 17-year-old girl killed by Chikatilo in August 1984, threw a heavy chunk of metal at Chikatilo, hitting him in the chest. When security tried to arrest the young man, other victims' relatives shielded him. On the 14th of October, the court reconvened to hear formal sentencing. This sentencing would not finish until the following day. Judge Akubjanov began sentencing by announcing Chikatilo guilty of 52 of the 53 murders for which he had been tried. He was sentenced to death for each offense. Chikatilo was also found guilty of five counts of sexual assault committed during the years he worked as a teacher in the 1970s. In reciting his findings, the judge read the list of murders again, before criticizing both the police and the prosecutor's department for various mistakes in the investigation which had allowed Chikatilo to remain free until 1990. Particular criticism was directed towards not local police, but the prosecutor's department, primarily Procurator Issa Kostoyev, whom Judge Akubjanovs gave as negligent and who had been dismissive of Chikatilo's inclusion upon a 1987 suspect list compiled by police. Okubtanov also rejected the numerous claims Kostoyev had made to the media in the months prior to the trial that police had deliberately withheld documents pertaining to Chikatilo from the prosecutor's department as being provably baseless, adding that proof existed he had been in possession of all internal bulletins. On the 15th of October, Judge Akubjanov formally sentenced Chikatilo to death plus 86 years for the 52 murders and five counts of sexual assault for which he had been found guilty. Chikatilo kicked his bench across his cage when he heard the verdict, and began shouting abuse. However, when given an opportunity to make a speech in response to the verdict, he again remained silent. Upon passing final sentence, Judge Akubjanov made the following remark. Taking into consideration the horrible misdeeds of which he is guilty, this court has no alternative but to impose the only sentence that he deserves. I therefore sentence him to death. Chai Catalo was taken from the courtroom to his cell at Nova Cherkask prison to await execution. He did lodge an appeal against his conviction with the Russian Supreme Court, but this appeal was rejected in the summer of 1993. Execution following the rejection of his appeal to the Russian Supreme Court, Chikatilo filed a final appeal for clemency with President Boris Yeltsin. This final appeal was rejected on the 4th of January, 1994.On the 14th of February 1994, Chikatilo was taken from his death row cell to a soundproof room in Nova Cherkass prison and executed with a single gunshot behind the right ear. He is buried in an unmarked grave at the prison cemetery. Victims footnote Judge Leonid Akubjanov cleared Chikatilo of the murder of 15-year-old Laura Sarkisyan at his trial due to insufficient evidence. Sarkisyan, a runaway from Armenia, was last seen by her family on the 18th of June. In his confessions to police, Chikatilo had stated he had killed an Armenian girl in the early summer of 1983 and that she had been killed in a stretch of woodland located near Kerpichnaya Station. Although Chikatilo had been unable to identify Sarkisyan's picture when presented to him, the timing of Sarkisyan's disappearance and Chikatilo's physical description of the victim, her clothing, and where he had killed her did match scattered 
partial skeletal remains and personal effects which, although determined as being those of a female in her early to mid-teens, could not be precisely identified. God, although he had at one stage denied having committed six of the murders for which he had been brought to trial, Chikatilo never specifically disputed Sarkisyan as being a victim of his Suspected victims Chikatilo confessed to three additional murders which police were unable to verify. According to Chikatilo, these three murders were committed in and around the city of Shakti between 1980 and 1982. Despite his confessions, police were unable to either match his descriptions of these victims to any missing persons reports or locate any human remains. Despite thoroughly searching the locations where Chikotilo stated he had committed these murders, therefore, he was never charged with these three further killings he claimed to have committed. Chai Catalo is the prime suspect in the murder of 18-year-old Irina Pagarialova, a court secretary from Batayusk who had disappeared on the 11th of August 1986 and whose body was found buried in the grounds of a collective farm on the 18th of August. Pogorielova's body bore precisely the same mutilations found upon victims Chikatilo killed both before and after 1986. In his initial confession, Chikatilo had denied he had killed Pogorielova, yet later insisted at his trial he had indeed killed her. At his trial, Chikatilo claimed he had committed four further murders in addition to the 53 for which he was brought to trial. Presumably, Three of these victims were the three he had initially confessed to having committed in 1990 and which the police were unable to either locate or match to any missing persons records. The fourth individual he specifically named as Irina Pogorielova. If his claims of having killed four additional victims are true, the total number of victims Chikatilo claimed is 57. Media Films The film Citizen X, 1995, is directly based upon the murders committed by Andrei Chikatilo. Inspired by Robert Cullen's non-fiction book The Killer Department, Citizen X largely portrays the investigation of the Rostov Ripper murders through the experiences of Detective Viktor Burkov in his efforts to ensnare the killer. This film casts Stephen Ree as Viktor Burkov, Jeffrey Timon as Andrei Chikatilo, Donald Sutherland as Colonel Mikhail Fetisov, and Max von Sido as Dr. Alexander Bukhanovsky. One of the film's central themes is the Soviet government's refusal to acknowledge the existence of a serial killer in USSR, until Perestroika. The film Evelenko, 2004, is loosely based upon the murders committed by Andrei Chikatilo. This film casts Malcolm McDowell as Andrei Evelenko and Martin Ksokas as Inspector Lezev. The film Child 44, 2015, is based upon the fiction novel Child 44 by Tom Rob Smith, which was itself inspired by the Andrei Chikatilo case, but with the era changed to the 1950s. The film was released in April 2015, and stars Tom Hardy as Leo Demidov, Joel Kinnaman as Vasily Nikitin, Numi Rapace as Ra Issa Dimitlova, and Gary Oldman as General Timur Nesterov. Books, factual, four non-fiction books have been written about the case of Andrei Chikatilo. Conradi, Peter, 1992. The Red Ripper, Inside the Mind of Russia's Most Brutal Serial Killer. True Crime. ISBN 0-86369-618-X. Cullen, Robert, 1993. The Killer Department. Detective Victor Bayurkov's 80-year hunt for the most savage serial killer of our times. Orion Media. ISBN 1-85797-210-4. Krivik, Mikhail and Olgin, Olgert, 1993. Comrade Chai Katalo. The Psychopathology of Russia's Notorious Serial Killer. Barricade Books. ISBN 0-942-63790-9.cs1 maint. Uses author's parameter. Link. Larry. Richard. 1993. Hunting the Devil. The Pursuit. Capture and Confession of the Most Savage Serial Killer in History. Harper Collins. ISBN 0-586-21846-7. Television Criminal Russia, The Trail of Satan, 1997.
A documentary focusing on the case of Andrei Chikatilo that was broadcast on the Russian TV channel NTV. Inside Story, The Russian Cracker, 1999. A BBC documentary focusing upon the disproportionate number of serial killers in Rostov-on-Don in the years leading to and immediately following the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the efforts of Dr. Alexandra Bukhanovsky to treat offenders. The case of Andrei Chikatilo is one of several included within this documentary. The Butcher of Rostov, 2004. A 45-minute The Biography Channel documentary focusing upon the murders committed by Andrei Chikatilo. Viktor Burakov is among those interviewed for this documentary. See also Notes Citations Cited works and further reading Conrad D. Peter The Red Ripper Inside the Mind of Russia's Most Brutal Serial Killer True Crime 1992. ISBN 0-440-21603-6. Cullen, Robert. The Killer Department. Detective Victor Bayurkov's Eight-Year Hunt for the Most Savage Serial Killer of Our Times. Orion Media, 1993. ISBN 1-85797-210-4. Hall, Allen. The Power and the Evil. Blitz Editions. 1994. Pages 82-86. ISBN 978-1856052085. Kalman, Robert. Born to Kill in the USSR. True Stories of Soviet Serial Killers. Friesen Press, 2014. Pages 177-198. ISBN 978-1460-227305. Krivik, Mikhail, Olgin, Olgert. Comrade Chai Katilo. The Psychopathology of Russia's Notorious Serial Killer. Barricade Books, 1993. ISBN 0-942-63790-9. Lane, Brian, Greg, Wilfred. The Encyclopedia of Serial Killers. Headline Books, 1992. Pages 96 ISBN 9780747237310. Larry, Richard. Hunting the Devil. The Pursuit. Capture and Confession of the Most Savage Serial Killer in History. Grafton, 1993. ISBN 0-06-017717-9. Mariner, Brian. Cannibalism. The Last Taboo. Arrow Books, 1992. Pages 237-247. ISBN 1859584950. Ramsland, Catherine. The Mind of a Murderer. Privileged Access to the Demons that Drive Extreme Violence. Prager Publishing, 2011. Pages 135-144. ISBN 978-0-313-3867-5. Wilson, Colin, Wilson, Damon. The World's Most Evil Murderers. Real Life Stories of Infamous Killers. Paragon Publishing, 2006. Pages 117-134. ISBN 978-1405-488280. Wynn, Douglas. On Trial for Murder. Pan Books, 1996. Pages 51-54 ISBN, 0-330-33947-8. External links Biography of Andrei Chikatilo at creativescapism.com Contemporary news article detailing Chai Catalo's 1992 murder conviction crime and investigation network biography of Chikatilo Encyclopedia Britannica article upon Andrei Chikatilo image gallery pertaining to Andrei Chikatilo.